All right. Hello and uh, good day to one and all. Uh, today we're going to talk about the problem of evil, uh, evil and we're going to try together to find some answers. Uh, this is a problem that humankind has wrestled with throughout history, especially in times of great suffering. And, and such as so many of us has experienced from this worldwide pandemic with, that we find ourselves in the midst of today. And, you know, we live in a time of great uncertainty as we look forward to the future and we look for answers from science, from religion, from philosophy. And of course, as a spiritist, I'll be referencing spiritist teachings, but also philosophical inquiries into the meaning of evil, as well as efforts to defend how God may still be considered to have the attributes that most religions and, and we as spiritists have recognized as belonging to God, in spite of the fact that those the world refers to as evil often prosper at the expense of those who are good. So let us begin by affirming the attributes of God. For spiritists, they are as follows. God is eternal. If he had a beginning, he must have either sprung from nothing or have been created by some being anterior to himself. It is thus that step by step we arrive at the idea of infinity and eternity. God is unchangeable. If he were subject to change, the laws which rule the universe would have no stability. God is immaterial. That is to say that his nature differs from everything that we call matter or otherwise. Uh, he would not be unchangeable. For he would be subject to the transformations of matter. Okay. And then God is unique. If there were several gods, there would be neither unity of plan nor unity of power in the ordaining of the universe. And God is all-powerful because he is unique. If he did not possess sovereign power, there would be something more powerful or no less powerful than himself. He would have not have created all things, and those which he had not created would be the work of another God. And then finally, God is sovereignly just and good. The providential wisdom of the divine laws is revealed as clearly in the smallest things as in the greatest, and this wisdom renders it impossible to doubt either his justice or his goodness. And it is this last attribute in particular that humankind has found difficult to accept in difficult times. And why? Well, because it's all too human that we all, that we're going to experience suffering. And while we're experiencing that, we often can't imagine ever being happy again. And yet it's something we rarely think about until suffering comes knocking at our own door. And then afterwards, when our lives are free of suffering once again, we can't imagine ever being unhappy again. Although hopefully we may have become more empathetic to the suffering of others. We hope that's the case. Still, uh, it's a fact that tragedy will visit every one of us sooner or later. And to illustrate this point, I wanna share with you a story I recently came across that, uh, you know, that is from uh, the Buddha, from Buddhism. And uh, this shows this very well. Okay. So in the life of Buddha, a woman once approached him with a lament that her only son had died. And would the Buddha, man of great spiritual power that he was, bring her back to life? The Buddha, after first considering telling her right out that this was something beyond his, uh, his capacity, decided to take another tack. And after expressing great sympathy for her, he replied, if I am to do anything, I will need a special kind of oil. So he specified which kind. And the woman, filled with hope, was on the point of leaving. Then he called her back to him and added this caution. He said, the oil must come from a home that has not seen death. Oh, that's easy, she thought. And then a week later, however, she returned, still mourning. I have not been able, she said, I have not been able to find a single home that has not seen death. My daughter, the Buddha said, looking at her commiseratingly, now do you understand? Death is the lot of every being, whether it comes early in life or late, come it must. So then, of course, the Buddha went on to talk about how uh, her faith could help to prepare her to deal with death when it comes. Uh, that's what it can do, but you know, it helps us to be able to face it calmly, peacefully. And it's much easier to face this challenge when we're willing to accept 
the gentle yoke that Jesus spoke of in the Gospels. Here's our gentle yoke. It says here, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And he adds, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So chapter 6 of the Gospel According to Spiritism explains the meaning of this passage from the Bible, telling us that we can find solace in the certainty of the future and confidence in God's justice. So this is about believing in the sixth attribute of God that we looked at earlier. And, uh, you know, that God is just and good and that it is impossible to doubt his justice or his goodness. And yet, if we're honest, there are times when, we're, when doubts do creep in, uh, when we experience tragedy in our lives and we question how God can allow these things to happen. And it's perhaps even more difficult to understand and justify tragedy when it happens to an entire generation. It was for this reason that I first gave this speech on uh, January 27, 2019. It was Holocaust Memorial Day. Okay, it's hard for us in our modern civilized era to imagine an evil more unspeakable than this. So here we have it saying the Holocaust was the systematic bureaucratic state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. The Nazis came to power in Germany in January 1933. They believed that Germans were racially superior. They claimed that Jews were inferior and a, thre a threat to the so-called German racial community. Okay, so a lot of terrible things happened back then. Uh, by 1945, the Germans and their collaborators had killed nearly two out of every three European Jews. This was their final solution to wipe out the entire population. And of course, during this era of the Holocaust, uh, German authorities also targeted other groups, uh, such as uh, the gypsies, uh, people with disabilities, Poles, Soviet civilians, and blacks. Uh, this is for their perceived racial and biological inferiority. And then also uh, they persecuted groups on political and ideological and behavioral grounds. So they persecuted communists, socialists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and homosexuals. And yet it's odd that the country that produced Hitler and Nazism, well, maybe not so odd, also produced the beautiful music of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. So, and I should point out that uh, this is something that has happened throughout human history. Uh, many races have uh, engaged in this behavior. And uh, so it's a terrible thing. But a major effect of this suffering, this massive suffering and death uh, from World War II was to distance many people from religion and from God. And uh, post-war artists and writers produced works that expressed that sense of distance and isolation. And uh, very striking was the absurdist movement, among all that, uh, championed by people like Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, and others. Uh, Eugene Ionesco, for instance, he was a playwright. Uh, he wrote a number of absurdist plays, uh, The Bald Soprano, The Chairs. And he described the absurd as this, that which is devoid of purpose, man cut off from his religious metaphysical and transcendental roots is lost. All his actions become senseless, absurd, useless. And of course, uh, since World War II, uh, humankind has had to grapple with many fresh tragedies, fresh horrors every day, uh, with the result that uh, many who were raised in a religious tradition left their religion, entering a designation of none in polls on the subject, as cited here in uh, Pew Research. It says about half of uh, current religious nuns who were raised in a religious, uh, in a religion, excuse me, indicate uh, that a lack of belief led them to move away from religion. This includes many respondents who mention science as the reason they do not believe in religious teachings and others reference common sense, logic, lack of evidence, or simply say they don't believe in God. So that's from Pew Research. So the result of all this, people who suffer have found no satisfactory answer to questions, uh, answer from religion, questions like, why do we suffer? 
Why weren't we created perfect? Why do those who are good suffer at the hands of those who are evil? And does God want us to suffer? And this last question, I was asked at a Spiritist Roundtable, a discussion that I attended uh, some time ago at my own center, and the Spiritist answer was given, that, was, that God does not want us to suffer, and that we only suffer when we make choices contrary to God's laws. And at the time, I have to confess, I reacted inwardly to this, thinking to myself, but we do suffer. And so I felt the need to explore that further. And I remembered a book I had read some 40 years ago in uh, college. Uh, it was called The Consolation of Philosophy. And um, I decided to reread it. And the author, Anicius Manlius Severinus Boethius, who uh, came to be known simply as Boethius, was born approximately 480 CE. He was a powerful, rich, and respected Roman senator. Uh, greatly admired for his accomplishments as a scholar. Then, in 523 CE, he was falsely accused of treason. He was arrested and thrown into prison. His lands, his wealth, his, pop, his reputation, all of this were taken from him in a single day. And then a year later, in 524 CE, he was executed. But while he was in prison, after overcoming his initial fall into despair, which was quite understandable. Uh, he overcame that despair and he wrote this, this book, The Consolation of Philosophy. And this became a beacon of light throughout the Middle Ages and it still resonates to the present day. It was there that I found crystallized some of the thoughts I had had when I attended that spiritist meeting. In the book, uh, Boethius describes his despair at being unjustly imprisoned uh, and this was for defending the honor of the Roman Senate against accusations by the emperor. So uh, the emperor at that time was Theodoric the Great. He quotes in the book the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who said, if there is a god, why is there evil? And if there is no god, how can there be good? So this was a condensed version of the thought of Epicurus. Here's a, here's a more complete form here I want to share with you. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is not, he is not omnipotent. If he is able, but not willing, then he is malevolent. If Is he both able and willing, then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing, then why call him God? So upon reading this, uh, I recoiled from this display of cold logic. I was taken aback from it, and I, I fell back on my spiritist teaching, uh, which I'm very thankful for. I've been involved in spiritism for about 27 years now. So spiritist teaching refutes this kind of logic in a number of ways. Uh, I want to share with you one refutation. Now, this is from the Introduction to the Spirits book. Here that is. When what men call reason is often only pride disguised and whoever regards himself as infallible virtually claims to be God's equal. We therefore address ourselves to those who are reasonable enough to suspend their judgment in regard to what they have not yet seen and who by uh, judging of the future by the past do not believe that man has reached his apogee or that nature has turned over for him the last leaf of her book. So that's from the introduction of the spirits book. So what this is saying here is that pride often blinds us with regard to our own limitations. And I'm also reminded of the passage in the Gospel according to Spiritism here. Uh, it states, never be too proud of what you know, because the limits of your knowledge on earth are very narrow. And the rest of that passage, which uh, many spiritists may be very familiar with, goes on to discuss how the gift of intelligence is an indication that the person who possesses it has a mission to use this gift to help people to come closer to God. So in this passage, this gift of intelligence is compared to a gardener being given a hoe to tend the master's garden. And it's suggested that it would be monstrous if that gardener were to raise his hoe against his master and attack him. The passage concludes with his thought, with the thought that if every man and woman of intelligence used it as God wished, the spirits would find performing their task of helping humanity advance much easier. So 
Getting back to Boethius, let me assure you before I go on that the rest of the consolation of philosophy is itself a refutation of the statement by Epicurus. And not only that, not much, much of what Boethius wrote is very much akin to spiritism. I recognize this uh, upon reading this the second time, 40 years after the first time. And uh, I should point out that Boethius, along with St. Augustine, represents an important bridge between classical Greece and Rome and Christianity. Both produced works that are among the earliest theodicies. What is a theodicy, you may ask? A theodicy is an attempt to answer the question of why a good God permits the manifestation of evil, thus resolving the issue of the problem of evil. Okay, so I've included here a picture of a, a book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And this is, I basically wanted to just show that theodicies are still going on right up to this day. They've been proposed throughout history right up to now. And this term, theodicy, was coined by a German mathematician and philosopher, Gottfried Leibniz in 1710. His work was Theodicy. Uh, his theodicy is this. He says, God has the idea of infinitely many universes. Only one of these universes can actually exist. God's choices are subject to the principle of sufficient reason. That is, God has reason to choose one thing or another. God is good. Therefore, the universe that God chose to exist is the best of all possible worlds. And now uh, this idea of the best of all possible worlds was uh, severely criticized by a number of people, uh, especially uh, so in a novel written by Voltaire in 1759 called Candide. Okay, so, uh, so Voltaire was himself an outspoken critic of the Roman Catholic Church and an early advocate of the separation of church and state. And the novel uh, tells the story of a progress from innocence to worldly knowledge by the main character, Candide, whose very name means innocence. And uh, Candide, after experiencing uh, many hardships and cruelties in his uh, worldly travels, comes to reject the teaching of his philosopher teacher, Pangloss, that it is the best of all possible worlds. But uh, let's look at how Leibniz explains the justification for his theory, his theodicy, excuse me. He says, I do not believe that a world without evil, preferable in order to ours, is possible. Otherwise, it would have been preferred. It is necessary to believe that the mixture of evil has produced the greatest possible good. Um, otherwise, the evil would not have been permitted. Okay. So somewhat circular reasoning there. So here we have the idea that evil serves the good. The suffering we endure at the hands of those who practice evil, if endured with patience and resignation, can be a spur to help us to achieve our moral improvement. As noted in this passage from the Bible, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, hope does not put us to shame is because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's, that's from Romans 5, 3 through 5. That's a beautiful passage. Now, getting back to early theodicies, it's been said that the explanation of evil is especially difficult for monotheistic religions, such as Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. In earlier religions, good and evil were on an equal footing, and uh, Spiritism explains this stage in human development. Telling us here, the limited nature of our human faculties prevents us from having a complete understanding of God's nature. As a result, in the early stages of human development, we often confused the creator with the creation and attributed to the former the qualities of the latter. So again, this is from the Spirit's book, chapter one, about God. Okay, so as we've already seen, this idea of our limited nature is a point often made in spiritist teaching. Okay. So, uh, in fact, uh, I'll read another passage. Indeed, not riches, power, or even the blossom of youth is our essential conditions for happiness because we're constantly hearing of people. Okay, one moment. 
So we're constantly hearing of people uh, of all ages, even those from the most privileged classes, bitterly complaining of the situation in which they find themselves. Uh, before this fact, it's inconceivable that anyone could envy the position of those who are apparently favored by fortune. In this world, despite what anyone can do, each must face his own part of work and misery, his quota of suffering and deceptions, from which it is easy to reach the conclusion that the earth is a planet of trials and atonement. Okay. Okay, so anyway, getting back to the passage I just read, uh, it goes on to say that uh, gaining this vantage point is like standing on a mountain and looking at the world below from a great height. Uh, we see from this vantage point how insignificant the actions of Jesus really are. Okay. But, um, okay. Uh, one moment. So we know as spiritists that this life is nothing compared to the life of the spirit. And uh, but when confronted by tragedy, we may easily forget the lessons we've learned. And this is where the value of the consolation of philosophy is. So we're presented with a, a situation of a man who had everything, fame, fortune, riches, all of that. And okay, so And I just want to point out this uh, this passage here, uh, Manichaean dualism, uh, getting back to uh, uh, Aristotle, excuse me, to, to uh, Augustine, who said that the universe, uh, this was an early uh, effort at the Odyssey hit by him. The universe is the product of an ongoing battle between two co-equal and co-eternal first principles, God and the Prince of Darkness. This was an early theodicy of him. And then later he came out with a more mature theodicy. Here that is. Evil does not exist as a substance or property, but instead as a privation of substance, form, and goodness. Therefore, if evil is a privation of substance, form, and goodness, then God creates no evil. All of God's creation is good. Evil is a lack of being and goodness. Okay. And uh, there is, of course, a prob problem with this theory. It, it provides only a partial solution to the problem of evil, since if God creates no evil, we must still explain why God allows privation evils to exist. Okay, so that's a problem. Okay. And uh, so this is answered in the Constellation of Philosophy, and of course also by Spiritism, uh, which uh, he talks a great deal about fickle fortune. We have a picture of that wheel of fortune. Here you see the king sitting at the top. And as the wheel turns, uh, those who are on top uh, go by the wayside. They fall off the wheel. They're hanging on the wheel for dear life at the bottom of the picture here. On the left, you see someone rising. Their fortune is rising to the top, and it's constantly changing. And, uh, okay, so Boethius talks about this in the Consolation. And it, he asks, why is it that God allows wicked men to cause the good to suffer? Why they themselves appear to prosper while they prosper? And Lady Philosopher, Philosophy tells him that the wicked only seem to prosper convincing him that evil being only the absence of good does not exist. And uh, this should found, sound familiar to us as spiritists, it's because it cannot pre procure the highest good, which is God. Evil pursues wealth, power, fame, pleasure, but all of these can be taken away. So uh, this is what, uh, similar to uh, uh, what Illyrio de Sequerophilio uh, points out in his book, Suicide or False Solution, and uh, uh, first, I want to look at this. Uh, this is a point of view, again, emphasizing this idea uh, that our point of view has a huge effect on how we see things. So here from uh, the Gospel According to Spiritism, the clear and precise idea which can be formed of a future life pro provides an unshakable faith in what is to come. This faith, uh, faith pro uh, places enormous consequences upon the moralization of man, and uh, uh, because it completely changes the point of view as to how life on earth is regarded. Okay, so, and as uh, Jesus himself says, my kingdom is not of this world. And uh, with these words, as it says here, uh, Jesus clearly refers to a future life, which he presents in all circumstances 
as the goal which humanity must reach and which should constitute man's greatest preoccupation on earth. So when we get into uh, the consolation, uh, we get a lot of uh, discussion about this with, as I mentioned, the discussion of fate and uh, which uh, and talking about how the types of things that we normally go after, uh, wealth, power, fame, pleasures, these things do not procure the highest good, which is God. So evil does not have any real power, and that's why it really does not exist. So here we have a uh, uh, quote from uh, Alirio de Siquerofilio in his book, Suicide, a False Solution. And he uses this parable of the banquet to illustrate the way uh, that to reach the highest good. And he says here, in reality, a great banquet represents the opportunities all human beings have to reincarnate in order to develop virtues. So this is not representing riches and power, fame and, and uh, pleasures. What he talks about here He's illustrating the reach the high the way to reach the highest good. Okay, so to develop virtues, the so-called qualities of the heart, those fundamental virtues that help us to become more conscious, the delicacies served in the banquet are the virtues that, that we all must aspire to. And that lady philosophy is in agreement with this idea of the development of the virtues in uh, the Boethius' book. And she refers to them being housed in Boethius's inner citadel. And she goes on to give a beautiful explanation of the workings of providence by making comparison of the movement of celestial objects around the same central point. So here we have that. Uh, so it says the innermost moves toward the simplicity of the center. And whereas the outermost tends to increase its orbit in space the farther it moves from the center. Therefore, the changing course of fate is to the simple stability of providence as reasoning is to the intellect." Okay, so that's, that's beautiful. Uh, it gives you the sense of the place of reasoning to intellect. And uh, that's a beautiful passage. Okay. So reasoning is in harmony with the spiritist idea that as we progress, we're less ruled by matter, more aligned with God, who is the source of all happiness. Finally, then, uh, you know, Buith is still not satisfied with the arguments of lady philosophy. And he asks, how can there be free will if God knows all that is to happen? And uh, we give you a spiritism's answer to this question first. Uh, question 851 in uh, the Spirit's book. Is there a fatality in the events of life in the sense commonly attached to that word? That is to say, are the events of life ordained beforehand? And if so, what becomes a free will? And the answer, there is no other fatality than that which results from the determination of each spirit on incarnating himself to undergo such and such trials. By choosing those trials, he makes for himself a sort of destiny which is the natural consequence of the situation in which he has chosen to place himself. Okay. And then it goes on to say, uh, I speak now of physical trials, for as regards moral trials and temptations, the spirit always preserves his freedom of choice between good and evil and is always able to yield or to resist. A good spirit, seeing a man hesitate, may come to his aid, but cannot influence him to the extent of mastering his will. On the other hand, a bad spirit, that is to say, a spirit of inferior advancement, may trouble or alarm him by suggesting exaggerated apprehensions. But the will of the incarnated spirit retains, nevertheless, its entire freedom of choice. Okay, so now to the answer of philosophy to uh, Boethius, which many believe is the most significant contribution of the book. And here's what philosophy says. God sees as present those future things which result uh, from free will. Therefore, from the standpoint of divine knowledge, these things are necessary because of the condition of their being known by God. But considered only in themselves, they lose nothing of the absolute freedom of their own natures. There's no doubt, then, that all things will happen which God knows will happen, but some of them happen as a result of free will. And although... They happen, they do not, by their existence, lose their proper natures, by which before they happened, they were able not to happen. Okay, 
So this is a bit convoluted, but this brings us to the central point, one of the central points of, of the constellation. God is omnipresent. That is to say that God is present, uh, not only to the present that we human beings experience, but also to the past and to the future. God exists outside of time. And so we can see all, he can see all. God knows what will happen, but does not, this does not preclude free will. Humankind's mistake is in assuming that God sees the future in the same way that humans see it. God does not have foreknowledge, but instead has knowledge of what is to God a never changing present. That's an important point. To illustrate this point, I'd like to take you on a musical journey that illustrates our, our limited human uh, ability to understand the present reality of our material world. And I'm gonna play a portion of uh, the Moldau which is by, uh, as you can see here, by Bedrick Smetana. And this evokes the flow of the Vlatava River, which is in German, the Moldau. It's a lot easier for me to pronounce. And from its, it comes from its source in the mountains of the Bohemian Forest through the Czech countryside to the city of Prague, where it flows triumphantly through the city. Uh, but it begins as a, a simple stream. And uh, one moment while I set that up. So we have this music, which I'm about to play. And I'd like you to follow along and uh, think of there. You'll hear a flute solo. Uh, and then this represents musically a, a tiny stream in the mountains. And then you hear another flute uh, solo joining the first. And they mingle together. And little by little, this forms the Moldau. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to play that for you now. Here we go. So here is our single flute, which represents one tiny stream. Now at the second flute solo, joining the first. So these streams are mingling together, flowing through the mountains. And as we listen to this, I'd like us to be mindful that God is listening along with us. Okay. So, we hear this transformation, humble mountain streams into the mighty Moldau. And as we're listening, I'd like us to step back from this experience and try to imagine how God is listening to this music. God is hearing the music in its entirety. I'm gonna turn it down a little bit here. The river's becoming quite mighty. I can't speak over it. So. So God is listening to this as we listen, but God is also listening to this music in the past. When the music was composed by uh, Smetana, uh, he's witnessed the first performance. He's witnessing every subsequent performance up to this moment, and even performances that will be done in future. Not only this, while we're listening to this music, God is aware of every occurrence on the planet, every river on the planet, its beginning, its formation, its flow. And God is aware of everything else going on on the planet. So not just our planet, but the entire solar system, the galaxy, and all over the universe. But in the past, present, and future, all of this while we're concentrating on one river, in one country, in one fragmentary moment of time. And it's a beautiful piece of music that runs for about 12 minutes. And I can't play all of that, I'm sorry. So I'm just going to turn that down now. But you, uh, I do invite you to listen to this beautiful music. It is uh, truly a beautiful piece. And 
you get a chance, try to try to listen to that. It's it's a great piece of music. So there we go. So I hope that illustrated my point that God is present to the past, the present, and the future. Everything is present to God. And is God is experiencing the entire universe while we experience this tiny fragment of time. All right. So I hope that illustrated my point. So now we finally arrive at the theodicy of the consolation of philosophy, the explanation of why of why God is good. And it is a skeptical theism, which I believe is also the theodicy of spiritism. Skeptical theism is the view that God exists, but that we should be skeptical of our ability to discern God's reasons for acting or refraining from acting in any particular instance. In particular, says the skeptical theist, we should not grant that our inability to think of a good reason for doing or allowing something is indicative of whether or not God might have a good reason for doing or allowing something. So over and over, Spiritism tells us that our limited human understanding is insufficient to understand the more uh, and, and more elaborate answers to our questions. Uh, as this is stated very clearly in Genesis, and whose faculties are limited cannot compass or understand all the designs of the Creator. That is why he finds oftentimes wrong and injustice in that which he would realize to be just and admirable if he could see its cause its end and definite results. In seeking the reason for the existence and utility of everything, he will surely discover that all bears the imprint of infinite wisdom, and he will bow before the wise power, even in things which he fails to comprehend. So that's a, a beautiful passage, very clear. So again, Boethius is in agreement with Spiritism on this point of human limitations. Okay. And here's a passage from the Consolation that uh, agrees with that. Uh, the, I call it the knower and the, and the knowable. People assume that the limit of their knowledge depends on the capacity to be known of the objects of knowledge. But this is wrong. Things that are known are not comprehended according to how knowable they are by nature, but rather according to the ability to know of those who are doing the knowing. So that's an interesting point there, I think. So to conclude, for all the logical analysis that's done in the Constellation of Philosophy by Boethius, he finally comes to the conclusion that we can't second guess God, that we can't fathom the reasons why things are as they are, or even perceive clearly the small portion that we're able to see of the immense universe that surrounds us. But Boethius also concludes that the pursuit of the good, which is the quest to come closer to God, to the supreme good, God, which is of the highest importance. Uh, that is the reason. That's the highest reason. He further reasons that those who practice evil have no real power because their attempts to achieve happiness are misguided in the pursuit of wealth, power, fame, pleasure. He reasons their methods cannot possibly bring them true happiness. So the Roman emperor was able to take away Boethius' wealth and power but he could not destroy his inner citadel. That's uh, the part of him inside that houses his hard-earned virtues. So because of this, the wisdom of Boethius endured in this great writing of his. It became a beacon of hope and light through the darkness of the Middle Ages. Okay, so let me make one last reference to the Holocaust. Let's return to that theme. Here we have another beacon of light. Eva Kor. She not only endured, but managed to forgive her Nazi persecutors. And this is the triumph of good over evil. So it says here, the day I forgave the Nazis, privately I forgave my parents, whom I hated all my life for not having saved me from Auschwitz. Children expect their parents to protect them. Mine couldn't. And then I forgave myself for hating my parents. And then finally, Forgiveness is really nothing more than an act of self-healing and self-empowerment. I call it a miracle medicine. It is free, it works, and it has no side effects. That's beautiful. So this is the triumph, again, of good over evil. I, I recently saw a documentary about her. In one scene, she's shown walking arm in arm through the ruins of our Auschwitz with a former Nazi commandant who had been in charge of that horrific place when she was there. 
So this is how we shape our destiny, as Leon, Leon Denis so eloquently states in Life and Destiny. He says, every time that we accomplish a good or generous action uh, or do a work of charity and devotion or make a sacrifice, do we not feel a sense of exaltation? Something expands within us and a flame is kindled which revivifies the depths of our nature. This is not illusionary. The spirit is radiated by every altruistic thought, by every act of unselfish love. Okay, so of course we believe as spiritists that we live many lives in order to arrive at perfection. So an answer to why we're not perfect, spiritism tells us it's because we would not appreciate it if we didn't have to work for it. And we're counseled that if we're able to consider this one life we're presently living against the backdrop of eternity, if we can gain the higher ground and view more clearly the path uh, that we have taken and the path before us, and if we can accept the gentle yoke of Jesus, we'll find our way. So I will end here, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today.